Hello YouTube, Dave here again. I'm uh, going to continue my series now in the D&D 5th edition classes. The first episode I did was all about the Barbarian, and for now at least I'm going to continue going in the order they appear in the book. So this week's episode is going to be all about the Bard. Starting off, I just want to say that the Bard hasn't had necessarily the best reputation uh, for character classes throughout the editions. A lot of times they seem like something that you really want in the party, but you're not necessarily the person who wants to actually end up playing one. So, <clears throat> you know, maybe 5th edition has finally settled that. Uh, we'll have a look at the abilities and see, uh, see what we think. All right, so to start, I guess we can have a look at, you know, kind of what is a bard. And a bard is the quintessential jack-of-all-trades character. They can do spells, they can do uh, skills, and they tend to be quite knowledgeable, although they don't tend to excel necessarily in anything other than the knowledge. And of course, they're the people that go into a dungeon and play instruments, kind of like, well, ugh, that's quite the picture. But anyway, they've always kind of been one of those classes that people get made fun of for playing and that nobody really takes seriously. So I'm hoping that this has finally changed and we're gonna go over the uh, the different abilities. So for starters, they get a D8 for their hit dice, which is uh, you know pretty standard, I suppose. Uh, at least for fifth edition, I believe they used to have D6s in the previous versions of the game, but uh, in this version, it's a D8. They are proficient in light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, and short swords. And of course, they are good at uh, musical instruments. So you actually start with three um, musical instruments proficiencies of your choice. Your good saving throws once you're proficient in our dexterity and charisma. And unlike other classes where you have to choose from a list for your proficient skills, you can just choose any three. And that's from the class. You also get whatever you would give, have from your race if they give you any skill proficiencies, as well as uh, anything you get from your background. So we're going to start with the uh, the first major ability, which is their spell casting. So, you know, bards do cast spells. With uh, bards, they have a limited number of spells, but they tend to know more spells than they're capable of casting. So again, with that jack of all trades thing, they usually have a handy spell that they can use, but they don't, be, you know, they're not able to cast as many as say a wizard or a sorcerer would be able to. Their spell casting ability is charisma, which of course makes sense. Their spell save DC starts at 8, plus their proficiency bonus, plus their charisma bonus. So let's just take a first level bard with a 16 charisma. It starts with 8, their proficiency bonus is 2, which brings up to 10. And for 16 charisma, they would have a total of plus 3 for the modifier, which brings their spell save DC to 13. And that's for all the different spells that they cast. So it's based off the caster, not the spell level like it was in 3rd edition, for example where you had your base DC that added your uh, 10 plus your ability modifier plus the spell level. In this in this edition, it's, it's much more simplified, so there's just the one spell DC for any spell that you cast. You attack also with your Charisma, so you add your proficiency bonus and your Charisma modifier. So using the earlier example, at first level you would attack for a total of plus 5, 2 for your proficiency, and 3 for your ability. And that's, that's the thing there. There are actually bard spells that do deal damage. Uh, bards know a certain number of cantrips. They only get to know up to four total, but with cantrips, they're spells that you can use an unlimited number of times. So they always have access to them. And there are damage dealing cantrips. So, you know, there's never gonna be a point in time which they can't cast some sort of spell. They begin play knowing for four first level spells. And there's, there is a list of spells known in the, uh, the the column here, it's kind of hard to see just where the camera's set up, but there's spells known here, and then the number of spells per day. So at first level, they know four spells and they can cast two. They don't have to prepare spells ahead of time, so any spell that a bard knows, they're able to cast at any time. They're just limited to the number of spells they can cast per day. They also at first level get bardic inspiration, and it's similar to their inspire. Uh, competence and courage and things like that that they had in previous editions, they can use it a number of times equal to their charisma modifier. So using our, you know, our go-to example for the purposes of this video, with a 16 charisma, you would have three uses of it. Okay, it uses a bonus action 
and you choose one creature other than yourself. So you can't actually cast it on yourself. It's uh, one person within 60 feet who can hear you, and they gain the use of a bardic inspiration die, which is, starts off at 1d6. Uh, they, you know, they can use it within the next 10 minutes, so they don't have to use it right away, and they don't necessarily have to use it in the same combat. But whoever has it, if they make a d20 roll for an attack roll, saving throw, or skill check, or an ability check, I guess, because it could be something like even charisma, technically is a, is, or not charisma, sorry, initiative, is technically an, uh, an ability check using dexterity. So they can use that and they spend it, they spend the die and they get to roll an extra d6. So, you know, you roll your d20, you get your total, and if you're not happy with the number, you can add an inspiration die. The catch is, is that you have to use it before the DM states whether it's a success or failure. So if you're a DM and you have, you know, a bard in the party and they've used their bardic inspiration, try not to instantly tell somebody when the dice hits the table that it hits or misses or succeeds or fails. Just to be on the fair side, give them the chance to use that, uh, that class ability. Once you use all of your uses of the, uh, the Bardic Inspiration, you have to complete a long rest, which is a full night's rest. So starting off, you can only use it a number of times per day equal to your charisma modifier. And as you level up, the dice themselves increase in size. So it starts at a d6 at 5th uh, level to d8, uh, d10 at 10th level, and a d12 at 15th level. At 2nd level, they get the uh, Jack of All Trades ability, which allows them to add half their proficiency bonus rounding down to any ability check you make that doesn't already include your proficiency bonuses. So the keyword there is ability check, which includes all of your skills. If you're making a... Uh, it says ability check, so if you're going to make a strength check to try to break down a door, then you could add half your proficiency bonus with that. Uh, and an ability check, like I said, does include initiative, so you can technically add half your ability or your proficiency bonus to initiative, and you do round down. So when you do get plus three for your proficiency at fifth level, you're still only adding one to everything. It's not until you get plus four total that you would add plus two to all the things that you're not currently proficient in. At second level, they also get Song of Rest. So basically, while you're taking a short rest, they you know play a song just to sit back and relax. At the end of that short rest, anyone who you know uh, heals regains an extra 1d6 hit points. So if they're using their own hit dice, then they get an extra 1d6 to, uh, hit hit points back as well. And again, this increases as well as you level up. So at eighth level, you roll a d8 instead of a d6. Uh, at uh, 13th level, you, add, you roll a d10, and at 17th level, to d12. At third level, you have expertise. So you pick two of your skill proficiencies, so two of the three that you chose at first level, or you know the ones that you got from a class, or sorry, a background feature, or even one for your race, and you choose those two, you end up actually getting to add double your proficiency bonus. So at uh, at so see, you get this at third level, so you still have plus two. So let's just say you're proficient in, well, let's just say uh, perception. So instead of adding plus two plus your wisdom modifier to the uh, the roll, you'd be adding four plus your wisdom modifier. At uh, fifth level, they get font of inspiration. So at fifth level is when they actually regain all their uses of bardic inspiration after sh completing a short rest instead of just a long one. So once you reach fifth level, you can really start to, to use this ability. And at sixth level, you gain counter charm. So you gain the ability to use magical or sorry musical notes or words of power to disrupt mind influencing effects. As an action, you can start a performance that lasts until the end of your next turn. So it looks like it actually takes up two turns to use the way that it's worded because it, it lasts until the end of your next turn for the performance itself. Uh, during that time, you and any friendly creatures within 30 feet of you have advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed. A creature must be able to hear you to gain this benefit. And the performance ends early if you're incapacitated, silenced, or if you voluntarily end it, which requires no action. So if you start to use it and things kind of go awry, you can just drop the use of that and try to do something else instead. Uh, I'm not sure really how useful this is going to be. Uh, the reason for that is it doesn't say that it counteracts if you're already charmed or frightened, I believe, were the two different ones there. 
So you have to use it in advance of things to gain advantage. And the fact that it uses two full turns to do that, not sure if it's really worth it as far as that goes. But, you know, who knows? It may be something that's incredibly useful. It just doesn't seem like it to me at this point in time. Now, at 10th level, they gain what I think is their most useful ability of all, and that's magical secrets. So at 10th level, they, uh, you have plundered the magic or magical knowledge from a wide spectrum of disciplines. Choose two spells from any class, including this one. A spell that you choose must be of a level you can cast, as shown on the bard table or a cantrip. Uh, the chosen spells count as bard spells for you and are included in the number of spells known column on the bard table. So at 10th level, for example, your spells known goes from uh, 12, which you had at 9th level, up to 14. So you can use this ability and you can pick from any spell uh, class whatsoever. So that's, you know, it's druid, it's cleric, it's, um, you know, ranger and paladin sorcerer or wizard so at this point you could actually have a bard throwing fireballs so they can't cast as many spells but they can get some nice offensive ones or even something as simple as magic missile because you never know or utilitarian wizard spells cleric spells stuff like that uh, you gain two additional spells from any class at 14th and again at 18th so by 18th you can actually cast ninth level spells so this situation where you can have a bard who can cast fireball who can cast Heal, and who can cast True Resurrection as, as spells. So I think this is what really makes the Bard useful because, you know, they have, some, they have some ones that do damage, they have some ones that help everybody out, but with these you can really customize your character the way that you really want to and pick spells that you think will really come in handy. And then, of course, at uh, 20th level, they get Superior Inspiration. So at 20th level, if you roll initiative and you have no uses of Bardic Inspiration left, you actually regain a use of it. So you'll always have at least one use of Bardic Inspiration at 20th level. Uh, and that's it for the abilities that they get standard for everyone who plays a Bard. Uh, I think that they really did a great thing with the Bard in this one. Uh, they have things that uh, deal damage. They have spells that actually, they, they tend to focus on psychic damage but they have things that actually, you know, make them useful, make them more, you know, use, more sought out to play, I think, in my opinion. The fact that, you know, at higher levels, they can actually pick different spells that they really want to use from any class, I think, is an excellent feature and what makes the Bard something that I would actually be interested in trying out. Uh, I have a player in my campaign right now who's currently playing a Bard, and it will be interesting to see uh, just what, you know, she does at higher levels uh, and, and how she chooses to customize her character. So that's it for the, the features that every bard gets, and I think I'm going to stick to the formula that I started with the video on the, uh, the Barbarian, where I take one video and talk about the generic abilities, and then I take my second video and focus on you know the more specific things, the more focused abilities that they get. Uh, most classes have something that they have to choose a third level, that's kind of a path, so to speak. Um, with the Barbarian, you have the Totem Warrior or the, uh, or the Berserker. So. Uh, the bards have bard colleges, bardic colleges, and they're different uh, different focuses for how they use their abilities. So I'll talk about those in part two. So I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, be sure to check out part two where I talk about the bard colleges.